It's great to be with everyone. Um, so first of all, the good thing is that I was, I, I was, I, I grew up, I was born in Israel, but raised in the United States. So you don't have to deal with this horrible Israeli accent, okay, <laughs> for the next 20 minutes, and I can speak like a normal American. So. Um, um, like the rabbi said, um, I, I kind of live a double life, okay? I have, my life is divided into music. I'm an artist, uh, a musician, a singer, and I play a few instruments. And until COVID, that was a bigger focus. After COVID, I transitioned to put more of my focus into business, and I have an amazing firm in Israel. It's actually an American firm. And uh, we do the executive coaching and transformational programs in business and companies and businesses from Boeing to General Electric to IBM and to uh, NASA and the FBI and all kinds of great companies. I get to work with really extraordinary people and make them even more extraordinary. More extraordinary. I'll take this one. Hello. Okay, so I thought about what I wanted to speak with you today. Um, and about five minutes ago, I came to the conclusion of what I was going to say. So it's 2006. It's August of 2006. And there's a war that's going on between Israel and between Lebanon. I'm a young tank commander at the time, a senior tank commander, though I'm 20 years old. And, um, And there's a city on the northern border, a town, it's not even a city really, on the northern border between Israel and Lebanon, it's called Metula. It's right on the border, on the north. And there are rockets falling all over the place in Israel because the Hezbollah is shooting rockets in. And I'm sitting underneath a peach tree inside of a peach orchard on the Israeli side. It's beautiful. There are peaches all over the trees. It's great. And my tank is sitting over there. Okay, big giant war machine. And the farmer, his name is David David Greenberg, comes over to me with a newspaper and a pita with some an omelet in it, and he brings breakfast to me and my crew. And he's really upset. And I say, David, you, David, you look you look upset. And he says, Of course I'm upset. I'm supposed to harvest all the peaches off the trees, but this damn war is going on, and now ev all my workers, all my employees, they all ran away, and that's it, I lost the harvest. And I said, I'm sorry about that. He's like, yeah, who's gonna, re who's gonna reimburse me for all this? I said, I don't know. And he gives me a newspaper and I open up the newspaper and on the front page I see the little passport, you know, like photos of some of my soldiers, my soldiers, who in a different area were killed and a few of them injured. And I look at it and I say, my God, this is like the most surreal thing. I just saw these guys a few weeks ago. And um, then I look at the date at the top right of the newspaper. And it was about a month into the war, and I hadn't really, um, I hadn't really been connected to what the date was because you're just in the war. So I look at the date, and I see, oh, my God, my, my older brother, Leo, he's supposed to get married in three weeks. Like, there's a wedding in three weeks, but there's a war going on, and I'm on the border, and I'm probably going to be going in soon, so what's supposed to happen? And my older brother getting married was a really, really big deal. He's been through some really gnarly stuff in his life, and we weren't sure that was going to happen. And finally, for my mom at least, it was a big deal. And, um, and this, this wedding had to happen, so I'm sitting underneath the peach tree, and I grew up a pretty secular kid, by the way, and... Um, and I sit under the peach tree, and I distinctly remember telling myself, well, not myself, saying, God, listen, man, I don't know what you have in the cards for me over the next couple of weeks, okay? But if it's in your plan to kill me, the wedding's, the wedding's not going to happen. So at least do me a favor and injure me or something, okay? Because this wedding's got to happen. Fast forward a couple of days. It's clear that we're going in. My captain, his name's Gidi, he gets all the tank commanders together. We send the soldiers, the tank crews, over to the tanks to start filling them up with ammunition. And the tank commanders were all kind of in a huddle. And Gidi, the officer, the captain, he says, he says, guys, tomorrow night we're going to be going in, we're gonna be inside of Lebanon. And look around, 
this is serious. It's not going to be easy. Look around because not all of us might be coming back. And we look around and then we pass around a, like a plastic bag and we're requested that everyone puts their cellular phones into the plastic bag because when we go into enemy territory, we don't take our phones with us. Fast forward a few nights later. Well, not a few nights later, like the, the next night, crossing the border into Israel. I'm at the top of my tank. My, hand is, my head is sti sticking outside of the top of the tank. That's what the commander position does. It's about 3 a.m., and we're crossing the border. And the military moves during darkness so that, we're, so that we can go unseen, especially tanks, which are giant, and they make a lot of noise. The enemy, we don't want them to see us. But there's one problem. There's a full moon, and it is so bright, it is if... You know, even though everything's dark, that moon is like a spotlight, and it every, it's lighting everything up. You can see, if, the, if, this was, if it was in the middle of the night right now, and that full moon was right here, we would just, we'd be able to see each other kind of like this. Maybe not as bright, but we'd be able to see each other's eyes, our faces. And the whole time I was thinking, looking at that moon, I say, oh man, this is bad news. And there was fear, but the army's marching, so you can't stop. You know, we're going in. This is happening. And we were actually happy about it. And there was one thing that I found, again, a secular kid, there was one thing that I found suddenly that was on the tip of my tongue. Again, looking at the moon and saying, I do not know what's in the, what's in the cards here and what's going to happen. But the only thing that kind of suddenly came out of me was, Shema Yisrael Adonai Elokeinu Adonai Echad. It's the only thing that I had to say to myself. I had nothing else except my crew and my weapons and God. And immediately, the fear that I had went away. And I knew, you have my back, I have your back. Let's do this. Let's do it. Fast forward a few days later, I'm leading a convoy of, uh, of tanks through an Arab uh, Lebanese village called Rabat al -Atin. Inside of the tank, we communicate with, um, with uh, internal communications, okay? We have, like, these helmets, and we speak through, like, these, uh, what do you call those things? And, um, yeah, like these internal microphones, like these mouthpieces, right? And um, thank you. And as I'm leading this convoy, we're maneuvering between some buildings. And I tell my driver, Yaniv, a young tank commander, I was his senior, and tank commanders can do any profession in the tank. So I needed a driver. He was a young tank commander. I said, Yaniv, drive for me. So he goes in, and he was my driver. At some point, while we're maneuvering through this village, I tell Yaniv, driver, I give him a command, driver back, like drive in reverse, right? So Yaniv pulls the tank into reverse, and we start rolling back. And I look behind over my shoulder, and I can see that there's a building behind me. So I say, okay, we're gonna get, we're gonna inch closer to that building, and then we're gonna stop, kind of like parallel parking. You know, you you don't want to hit the, hit the car behind when you're parking, even though sometimes you do, and you don't tell anybody about it. But that's okay. I also wanted to inch closer to this building, and to stop. So I get closer, and I say, okay, Yaniv, stop, and the tank keeps on going back, and I look over and see we're getting closer. I say, Yaniv, stop. Driver, stop. The tank keeps going. Driver, stop. And the tank keeps rolling back. And I say, okay, we're going to hit this thing, which wasn't really a big deal for me because nothing really stops a tank. It weighs 100 tons, and if it hits something, it just goes through it. So I wasn't concerned about that. But I didn't like the fact that he can't hear me. My, my crew can't hear me. So I jump inside. I realize there's something going on with the communications, and I find the problem with the communications, and the second that I fix it, I feel a rumble in the tank. And I say, okay, we, I, guess, I guess we hit the building. And about two seconds later, there's this massive force on my head and on my back. I yell out because there was a huge pain. I hear this cracking noise. And I open up my eyes. And my mouth is filled with stones. I think, what is going on? 
and I'm suspended. I'm kind of I'm buried inside of my own tank, inside of rubble and debris. And I couldn't understand. It took my brain a couple of seconds to think, what just happened right now? And it took a couple of seconds at the, to realize that the building collapsed on the tank. And a couple of tons of concrete went falling through the up, open hatch above my head onto my back and, um, and crushing my body. And I feel a tingling in my toes. Now, I used to be a, a medic when I was in high school in Magen David Adom. And I thought to myself, big pain in my back, tingling in my toes, bad news. That sounds like a, that, that sounds like a spinal injury. So I try and wiggle my toes, and I can't really, I'm doing like a damage control on myself. Try and wiggle my toes, can't really feel anything. I try and like clank my ankles like Dorothy, can't really feel anything. Try and clank my knees together, bend my knees, I can't feel anything. Go up to my hips, try and like, you know, move my hips around, I can't really feel anything. Go to my stomach to make like a crunch, like a stomach muscle type of thing. I, I don't have a sense of it. I go to my chest to try and take a big breath. <gasps> and the second I take a breath, it's as if it felt like someone put a knife in my chest. Said, okay, I got it. I got broken ribs. Okay. Go to my right arm. Thank God my right arm was okay. I go to my left arm. Again, my left arm hurts a lot as if someone put a knife in my shoulder. Okay. Got my shoulder crushed also. I'm not in good shape. I can't move. I can't do anything. And then my thoughts <clears throat> were interrupted by my loader, one of my crewmen, his name is Yitzchak, starting to yell, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. Now there's a problem with this, right? What's the problem? That I'm not dead, right? So, so now I couldn't breathe. I could barely breathe, like breathing out of a straw. And he's saying, he's dead, he's dead. And all I could say is, Yitzchak, shut up. We probably watched too many Hollywood movies when someone gets injured, about to die, you hold them in your arms, you're going, it's going to be okay, we're going to get you out of here, and all this, and that's exactly what he did by the book, by the script, right? And, uh, and I can hear the external communications in my ears, he can't, but I could hear it, and he's like, there's a, hel there's a helicopter coming to pick you up right now, and I hear the helicopter pilot going, we can't land, we can't land, you know, it's like, he's totally full of it. And thank God my right arm was okay, so I grab Yitzchak by the shirt, and I, and I kind of, you know, calm him down. I say, come closer, and I say, Yitzchak, I have a spinal cord injury. I need one of you guys to hold my head in place, because that's one of the things you have to do. You guys have to dig me out of here as fast as possible. I can't breathe. I'm in a lot of pain. Just guys, get me out. And the guys jump into action very fast. And Yaniv, the driver who was a tank commander, thank God he was there, big, bulky, brawny guy, immediately jumped into action and uh, commanded that, you know, took, took command of that whole situation. And they got me out of there. They took about 40 minutes. They put me in another tank next door, drove me to the border, helicopter. And a few days later, I wake up in a hospital after all kinds of surgeries. And the war is over. And there's nothing like a good war to make Jews come together. So everyone's coming. The whole country shows up in my hospital room to come and, you know, visit the soldiers and with chocolates and, you know, ishkoach and all this. And I was in such bad shape. I was totally crushed. I didn't want to hear anything from anybody. But I was just cordial. I was a thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And at one point, a... Um, a young soldier who I didn't recognize comes into my hospital room. And he says, Ron, it's such a pleasure to meet you. You know, I've heard so much about you. And I said, thank you, thank you. He's like, how are you feeling? I said, wonderful. But how are you emotionally? Is it even better? I said, and how are you about with, you know, with how are you about what happened to Yaniv and everything? And I say, I, I, I don't know what you mean. He says, well, you know, what, how are you about what, with what, with Yaniv, and he started stuttering. And at, out of the corner of my left eye, I could see my mother going. So I said, hang on a second. What are you talking about? My mother steps forward and she says, Ron, when after you were injured, they needed to replace your tank. So Yaniv replaced you at the tank in the next night they came to visit you at the hospital and from there they went to 
the border and they went back into Lebanon and to the light of that same full moon, an anti-tank missile was fired at the tank and Yaniv was killed. It was hit, he was hit and killed. I said, what about the rest of my crew? He said, nothing happened to them, they're okay. So, rewinding back to sitting underneath that peach tree, you know, asking God to what his plans are for me in the next few days. And he fulfilled on his, uh, on his plan. At least he fulfilled on my request. Now, what is this? Now, this, the, the moral of the story isn't to depress anybody. But I'll tell you what I do want to leave you with. I get asked a lot of times, um, do I feel bad? You know, it, I, I, did have to, I did have to process, like, did Yaniv replace me or did he take my place or something like that? Okay? And I don't know. But I do know, I do have faith that, you know, God in his plan did whatever he had to do. But one thing that was really, uh, that I do want to talk to about is Yaniv. Big, brawny guy with the biggest smile on the planet. Everyone loved this guy. And I still do. And if there's one thing about Yaniv was that he was always smiling and always happy about all kinds of stuff. No matter what the situation was, he was one of these guys that was like, dude, what are you talking about? Just get him to stop with all that garbage. Just do whatever you need to do. That's, that was the vibe of the guy. And whenever, um, whenever I think, you know, whenever I hit those uh, once in a while, like we all do, hit those kind of speed bumps in life, and we have all kinds of moments where there's, we're not really that happy or that sad or there's something going on that isn't that great. We get in our head. I think about Yaniv, who is still 20 years old. That was 16 years ago. And in the last 16 years, you know, I've laughed and I've loved and I've, you know, and I've had dinner with amazing people and I'm here with you and we get to sit at this beautiful sanctuary among incredible people. And there's air conditioning. And life is pretty, pretty damn good, you know? And for the last 16 years, he didn't get a chance to do any of that. So whenever things get kind of rough or tough, I think to myself, what would Yaniv say about this? And I could hear him, you know, I could see a smile and him saying, dude, so she dumped you. Who cares? Screw her. Just go find someone else and da 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 You know, and he'd go find something to say to pick me back up and, and get me back out here into life because that's what he would do. So if there's any way to honor Israel or to honor the soldiers, whether they were injured or whether they were uh, killed, the best way to honor the soldiers is that we all just focus on living a really extraordinary life to fulfill on what God put us here to do and to just live a really, really, really great life and to forget about all the garbage that we have in our head. It's just a bunch of garbage anyway, all the bad talk and everything. I can tell you, I can tell you a lot of stories about that. But um, that's what I want to wish to all of us and to you that um, we walk out of here every day in life doing everything that we can to forget all the garbage, that all the self-talk that doesn't serve anything. And that we love the people that we love. We love the people that we don't love. We work on loving them. And that we do everything we can to fulfill what God wants us to do here, which is to make a difference.